Yeah, roll. No questions in general? All right. Here's here's a problem for you in the vein in which we've been working. Yes. Uh, <laughs> imagine a rock climber. Uh, most of you know that uh, uh, as a rock climber goes up the, up the face, they'll take with them a, a rope that they use for protection in case they fall. So we're going to figure out a little bit about what can go into that. Um, as, a, as a climber goes up trailing the rope, they'll occasionally put in a little bit of protection, what's called protection. It's, it's usually in the form of uh, like a like a, a, just a block of aluminum with a sling on it and they'll put the aluminum into a, a crack, jam it down tight, then attach a carabiner to that and then clip the rope through it and then keep on climbing. That way, uh, as the rope trails behind them and, and they often climb with pink ropes, as they, uh, as they climb higher and higher, that decreases the amount of distance that they'll actually fall because they'll only technically fall the distance they are above the last protection they put in plus then that much more because they'll fall down to the protection and then down however much rope they've got behind them and then typically the climbing ropes have quite a bit of stretch built into them something on the order of even 10 percent stretch to act as a bit of a cushion. So what I want to figure is given some of the possible parameters in this, let's figure out if the climber falls from 10 meters above his protection, what will be the force he feels when he finally comes to a stop? So he'll fall the 10 meters down to the protection, 10 more meters before the rope then it goes, goes taut again. So it'll fall down to about there and then the rope will start to tighten up and then the rope will stretch a little bit and it'll fall a little bit farther. One of, we want to figure out how much force is he going to feel that the rope exerts to bring him to a stop right about there, not knowing quite where that is. All right, so they'll be 10 meters down to the protection, 10 meters farther before the rope even gets tight yet. And by the way, the, the other end down here is supposedly held by his partner. Hopefully his partner won't panic, throw up his hands, go, oh my God, he's falling. As the rope then goes, Whoo! and he'll fall some little bit of distance farther that uh, we need to figure out. And figure out how much force then is exerted on him. Got the picture? Anybody in here a rock climber? Yeah, because all the other rock climbers are dead. So that was a test. You're not really a rock climber. You will soon all all rock climbers are ex-rock climbers. They either quit or they get killed. So let's say that he's 80 kilograms and that the rope has a spring constant of about 4.9 kilonewtons per meter. And we want to find the force exerted on that climber by the rope to bring him to a stop. And if you want, you can even figure how much time does he have to actually run this calculation if you can get it done in time. See if you can do it as fast as, as he could from the time he peels off the rock. Any idea how to do that? 
Let's think up a plan. Let's think it through a little bit before we just jump in and start calculating things. There's stuff to calculate. Doesn't mean it's going to be anything useful or going to take you anywhere. So let's let's think it through a little bit. Well, for kinetics problems, like this is, because it's a problem that involves force on something. We've got something accelerating in some measure or other. It's going to take some kind of force to do that. We only have two ways to solve those type of problems so far. We have one other coming, but we just haven't gotten to it yet. We essentially have two ways to solve kinetics problems. So you figure, I hope, it's got to be one of those. What's the first way we have to solve kinetics problems? That's the second way. What was the first way? Uh, no, kinematics might help us actually execute the solution because they'll give us extra equations when we don't have enough equations for the number of unknowns. But the kinematics is a separate part. In fact, if you remember, we did kinematics before we even mentioned kinetics, before I ever even mentioned force. We've gone all the way through kinematics. So what's our first way to solve kinetics problems? And good thing we're going over this since there's a test on this next Tuesday, right? So you'll have to look at problems and think this very thing, very thing. I've got two ways to solve force problems. Which of the two ways will be the easiest? Will be the, uh, the most efficient for me now? Lead to the most points? Work energy is one of them. What's the one that came before that? Uh, well, that's, that's part of it. So I'll give you credit there for that, Joe. F equals MA. Now, each of those methods, well, they're really very much the same. They, this, several of the terms in the work energy equation came directly from F equals MA. So it's not like they're mutually exclusive of each other. But they are cast in such a way that they, they at, in the form we have them, they solve different problems a lot easier than the other method might. What type of problems do these two solve particularly well? Position. Pardon me? I think I heard it. I think you're right. Position. Yeah, well, the work energy equation, if you remember, the work term has to do with how far an object's moved. The, uh, the uh, potential gravitational energy term had to do with how far an object's moved in uh, a gravitational field. And then the spring energy part had to do with how far a spring is spread. So it's very much a position dependent problem solver for us. Very good for position dependent problems. Which this one is. This whole problem depends upon where the climber is at any one instant. And in fact, even has something that we're going to treat just like a spring. That's essentially what the climbing rope is. It's a big spring attached to them. It just happens to be a spring in a much more useful form than a spring would be, but it's a very stretchy rope. They don't go climbing with steel cables attached to them because those will jerk them to a stop too quickly in some of those falls, and you don't have to fall very far for that, be, that uh, force exerted to be enough to kill you. Hopefully, uh, you hopefully you don't fall, and if you do, God forbid, you survive it. That's the hope. Um, what type of problems are best solved by F equals MA problems? Or, or by the F equals MA uh, equation that started this whole kinetics thing for us? Works best on well, general problems that are just, uh, what's the acceleration? Here's some forces, what's the acceleration? Or here's uh, some acceleration, what forces do we need? 
works works pretty well for that kind of thing. Acceleration doesn't appear directly in the work energy equation. Doesn't mean we couldn't get it from it, but it uh, it uh, doesn't appear there directly. But it also works best on constant force problems, which then would mean if it's constant mass, it would also mean a constant acceleration problem. So that's where it works best. You can apply either one in many other types of situations, but that is where they work the best. So you figure with a highly position dependent problem, including a spring in it anyway, that the work energy method would would do quite well for us. And we've been working on that for a couple days now. So um, to find the force it takes to stop them for a fall, let's see uh, where that's going to work for us in the work energy equation. The only place we have a force term in that equation is in the work term. That's the only place to form uh, that force appears directly. All the other things have other stuff in them, but force isn't one of them. So um, is that how we're going to find the force in this problem? Well, let's ask ourselves first here, uh, what forces count in this work term? Because remember I told you not all of them do, only some forces count in that term. Others we handle elsewhere. Non-conservative forces in this term. Like NPR radio, that's a non-conservative force, isn't it? You, anybody listen to NPR and would even get that? Come on, John, you get that, don't you? Yeah. Rush Limbaugh is always complaining that NPR is too non-conservative, too liberal. See, so that was the deal there. Yeah, uh, thank you. Laugh politely, not as guy. So yeah, yeah, just keep going, man. All right, non-conservative forces. Uh, is that what we're looking for here? Are there any non-conservative forces in this problem even? If there aren't, and this goes to zero, that's sure not going to help us find that, is that force a non-conservative force? And we need to account for it in the work term. Guys, you're just about to hit the rock here. You're you're halfway through your fall off the wall. What film? Was there air resistance? Around? No, we'll neglect air resistance. The the uh, he, he's climbing on the moon. No, no, then gravity would be less. He's uh, climbing at very high altitude. And you had a question or a statement of it? No, I thought you did, Bill. It. Is that force we're looking for? What's exerting this force that stops it? The rope. And we're treating the rope as a spring. Is this force exerted by the rope on the climber causing him to stop his fall? Is that a non conservative force? No. No, not for our purposes. That's being exerted by the rope, treating it as a spring. So that's going to be over here, except there's no there's no force term in that equation, in that part of the equation. We, we so what good's it going to do us? We, we know an equation of force and spring. What? Uh, force Remember it? Force is the force exerted by a spring is, it's actually minus K depth. 
the minus being if you stretch the rope one way, it pulls back the other way in the opposite direction. So that's why there's a minus sign. And if you if you push it and squish it up, which you can't do with the climbing rope, they only stretch one way. Um, so it's not like a real spring that could go two directions. Um, we've got K. If we could find del, then then yeah, we could find the force. And del, of course, is one of the terms in there. So we could solve for maybe solve the work energy term for del, put it in there, and we know the force on the climber. Any non-conservative forces? Remember, it's nice to go by term by term and get rid of stuff. Does he just get make the problem blocks? smaller? What? Does he get any the cut? Does he fall? No. In fact, his wall's much more exciting than that. It's an overhang, so he'll he'll fall free into space. A lot more exciting. If you're gonna fall, make it a good one. I always say. None. There's no limit how far the rope can stretch. Yeah. No. Wait, did you well, say I mean, it, yeah, of course there is. It can't stretch forever. What, you think he's going to go down, <laughs> just roll home Are you going into to bed, You're not and then the rope will stop him in bed <laughs> on his pillow? <laughs> go climb with Alan. You want to fall. Alan, Alan will climb anything, get to the top, and then just jump off. Okay, I'm going home. <laughs> yes, of course there's a limit to how much the rope will stretch. However, uh, we're not going to let him hit anything else. That's entirely different. Yeah, then there's, then there's other, though that would be a non-conservative force. Uh, once you hit the rock, you're not going to be able to get that force back and return it back the way it was. Uh, plus, that's a, a different type of problem. That's an impact problem. We're going to get to those shortly. You said the at the sec end of the second ten meters, the rope is taut. Taut. Yeah. Let me let me redraw the picture here. He put in some protection is now ten meters above that protection. So he's got a rope going from the protection up to him. I won't draw the rope that comes down to his partner and the belayer, the the person who's supposed to tighten the rope in case he falls, so it doesn't just play out. So he's going to fall down the 10 meters, down another 10 meters before the rope gets taut. Then the rope gets taut and we'll stretch and bring him to a stop. Except Alan's rope, we'll just keep going. Well, there's a the bell, right? It's subtract the 20, call it X. Well, look, wouldn't this right here just be Dell? Yeah. Be Dell. Yeah. Because that's right when the rope gets taut, anything after that is rope stretch. So if we could find that, we just put it in there and we'll know the force exerted on the climber by the rope. So let's look and check if we get rid of any of these terms. Any non-conservative forces? No? What about the rope itself exerting the force on it? Yeah, that's a spring force, so it's a force indeed, but it's a conservative force. Presumably, once he's able to grab the wall, climb up a little bit, take the stretch out of the rope, presumably everything's back to normal in terms of the rope. He's pooped his pants, but climbers do that. That's part of climbing. Right? <laughs> See, he's wearing white pants. He's a very brave climber. Somebody had a hand up. No, I was saying hooray. For him? No, we just pooping in general. <laughs> you just, he's fi finally he found something he wants to write down in his notes. Any non-conservative forces? Kinetic energy, right? Kinetic energy is not a force. Remember, forces are caused by things I can touch, Feel, look at, draw a picture of. I can't draw a picture. I can't touch kinetic energy. Plus, kinetic energy is a term over here anyway. Any non-conservative forces? 
No, as long as we keep them from hitting the wall, there are no non-conservative forces. So that term zero. Remember what I told you? Um, the situation we have when we have no external work being done? Remember what I called that on uh, Monday? That, that situation, that particular situation? Conservation. conservation of energy. If this term is zero, we have conservation of energy. However much energy we start the problem with, we finish with, we have at all times, it just transfers from one term to the other. In fact, that's what a fall is. He's got lots of gravitational potential energy. He loses it all, and it all turns into kinetic energy, and he's moving with great speed. That's what falling is. So any change in kinetic energy from start to finish, we'll call this the start, and this the finish, because that's where we're trying to find out how much force was exerted on it. No, it's the same. Oh, it's going to be the that's not what I asked them. We're trying to figure out what del is so we can figure out what that force is. Any change in kinetic energy. In fact, there's no kinetic energy at all here or here. So now there's not change. It's zero in both places. It's pretty high in between because he's moving at pretty great speed when he... When he uh, starts to tighten the rope, but until then, or after then, until the very end, there's no change in kinetic energy. Uh, but of course there's a change in gravitational potential energy. He falls, and of course there's a change in spring energy, because he, uh, the rope is, is, is taut just to the point where there's no slack in it, but in here it's being stretched so there's actually a lot of potential energy being stored into that rope from this potential energy. So I want you to figure out then how much force is exerted on him by finding this del using the work energy equation. Uh, just to help us out a little bit especially with what comes do this. We'll, uh, we'll take uh, well, I, I guess we don't need to yet, so just go ahead and, and uh, work on it, and then we'll, we'll set some other uh, boundaries in a little bit. So now we have a situation where nothing's left of the work energy equation but that. So use that to find what del is, how much stretch is in the rope, how much farther beyond that, that uh, bottom point there will he fall. Figure out how much force is exerted by the rope to do that. I think I've got to give you all the terms you need. You've got his weight, you've got the 10 meters. And you've got the spring constant and the fact that the rope is pink. Stuck, need a, a little help to get going here. Len's looking through his back issues of his climbing magazines. Here's a hint right there. Don't get involved in any hobby where the back of the magazines has an obituary section. <laughs> there's, there's a, there's a lot of, I'm, I'm your advisor, there's my advice right there.
You got it already, Alan? I think I got it. Really? It's fun. It's a freestyle. It's fun. Nope. Okay. Nope. Yeah, heaven forbid you do it the right way. Yes. You tell me. Check your units. Your units will tell you what it should be. There's only one way it's going to work, so the units work. You got to be able to factor it out sometimes. Yeah, del, del is going to be your unknown. You're going to have a one equation, one unknown, and del will be the unknown. Then we find del. Which I guess we have two equations, two unknowns, because then we want to end up with the force in the end. But with work energy equation, you'll have one equation, one unknown, and you'll have delta. Remember, my suggestion is work out each term one at a time. So you get each piece of them, you can check the signs on them, you can check the units on them. This makes the problem uh, in a much more uh, manageable, efficient way to solve it. Joey, you okay? You staring at it, seeing if that'll make it work? Okay, keep going. Well, go on to the next term then. Gotta do it sometime anyway. Go on to it and see if that helps you. Mike, you doing okay? Got it?
Yeah. Now you're doing okay. Yeah. Now, uh, careful though, it's What's minus mm -hmm. and minus. As the whole distance is 20 plus del, but down it would be minus 20 minus del. I got you. What, man? Do you have a question to ask? No? the delta H. A lot of students do that. This is like a vector equation. If we have vector here and vector here, they make it possibly be equal. With delta here, we're going to have delta over there for them to be equal. M, of course, is the mass of the climber. 80 kilograms. G, what'd you put in for G? What's so funny, Mike? What'd you put in for G? 9.8 meters per second squared. For the millionth time, he's falling down. Gravity is down. So what'd you put in for G? 
Last year, last year when students would fall for that every single time, well not all the students, but there would always be one student at least still, still remaining who would want that minus sign. A couple of you did yesterday. A couple of you tried pretty hard to get that minus sign in there on G. It's not there. Minus hasn't even come up yet. Delta H. How far, what's the distance he falls? Delta minus Del minus 20 meters? Uh, 20 meters. What? He's going to go from here to here. How far is that? You held up the tape measure. That's 20 plus del. And we can just put the minus sign out in front. That'll do. Work just as well as anything. If you'd rather, you can put the minus 20. Sorry, that's 20 plus del. You could put the minus here, be minus, minus, minus 20, minus del, but that's the same thing. Uh, the 20 plus del is the distance. The minus shows us, uh, again, that he fell in the downward direction through this gravitational field. Do the units work out? What should the units be? on every one of these terms. Joules are newton meters. Newton meters is usually good enough. Kilogram meters per second squared, that's a newton meter. As long as del is in meters, the units are going to work out just fine. So whatever number we come up with in the end for del, we already know ahead of time it's got to be meters because that's how it's going to work out with what we've got here. So you can multiply this thing through. You get what? Minus 15,696, is that right? Minus 785 del, and we already know that that all is going to be Newton meters because we worked that out. Anybody can not get those numbers? Del remembers the unknown we're looking for. You know, there, there it sits. We've got to uh, figure out some way to solve it there. Delta UE. How do we calculate that? Well, the equation is one half. K del 2 squared minus del 1 squared. What are we looking for here? Del 1 or del 2? We have a del here, but it doesn't have any subscript on it. Is it one of these? Remember, when he gets down here to point two, we want that stretch in the rope. That's del two. So what we're looking for is del two here. We want the amount of stretch when he's at point two. What is the stretch in the rope when he's at point one? Isn't there 20 meters of rope? In fact, isn't there at least 40 meters of rope down to his partner? Yeah. So what's del 1? Yeah. What, Tyler? Zero. It's zero. It's the amount of stretch in the rope. As he's climbing up to that point, remember, the rope is just hanging there behind him. It doesn't really have any stretch in it. So del 1 is zero. So we've got one half. I gave you K. Uh, that's in kilonewtons. 
which will make this equation kilonewton meters, unless we make a change to it. 4.9 kilonewtons is how many newtons? 4,900. 4,900. Newtons per meter. So to stretch a climbing rope one meter, you need to apply 4,900 newtons to it. You can haul a lot of apples up there. Del 2 squared. Will that give us units of newton meters? Yeah, of course it will. We have newtons per meter times meter squared. This will be newton meters as long as del is in meters. And we already said that. So del 2 has got to be in meters. Uh, that equals what? 20, 25, 50? All right. Did I do that number right? 2450. Inflation. Now what? Well, now we, we put these two back together like that and see what we've got. We've got uh, minus. 15, 696 minus 785 del 2 plus 2450 del 2 squared. That looks like a pretty simple quadratic equation. One equation, one unknown. Anybody here downloaded the quadratic equation solver? So, if I were you, I'd look around the rest of the room, see who's willing to borrow it for five bucks. Four bucks? You can't go below what I'm going to charge you for the answer. Sorry, Phil. Sorry, John. Guess nobody's buying it. Now, remember, most quadratic equations have two roots. One of them's going to make sense here, and one of them's not. John and Bill, do you have the same roots? Since you're the only two, two points. smart enough to go get the quadratic equation solver. 2.7, negative 2.4. Phil, you concur? Or you forgot how to run your solver? Maybe, maybe if you gave John five bucks, he'd tell you. You pay him three, and then you charge Alan five. Come on, guys, Mike's waiting. He's being very polite about it. What do you got, Phil? Alright, well we'll go with uh, we'll go with John. Oh, well, let's see. Um, so you had what? 2.7 and negative 2.4. And we already know that's meters because that's the only way everything else worked up above. So there's two, two roots there. Which one makes sense for us? Uh, the positive is French. It didn't. John said he thinks 2.7 makes sense because it's positive and that means stretch. What, now that you hear it, sounds <laughs> sound pretty bad? It, you know, I was just rephrasing. I was an idiot. But <laughs> what? I think that's how it works. It's, it's interesting. Possibility. What's the definition of del? Let's remind ourselves and uh, 
see which one makes more sense. What's the definition of del? It's called the, uh, the out of the box. I don't think so. The spring out of the box. Has to do with that, yeah. It's what? It has to do with that. Come on, you got to know what del means here, or this equation is not going to help you. Any. Check your notes. If it's in there, I gave. I, I know I put it on the board yesterday. I remember doing it. We take an hour or two to run back through yesterday's take. Or you can check your notes. It's in there somewhere. It's in there somewhere. Just check your flip back a couple pages. Ow! Stop! I see it. You see it? I do. Where? Right there under your nose. Oh. Oh my. Oh. L minus L not. Yeah, there. Here, let, for words. let me help you. There, I circled it. Shock. What's L? Oh, or as the British should say, what the L? I'm just kidding. You never really say that. You never would. What's L? Is that the length of the final length? That's the length of the rope at any time right. in the problem. So if we're looking for del 2, we're going to put in L2 there. So his rope, let's see, uh, it was 10 meters, then he falls down. The rope is still 10 meters long, at least the effective length we're worried about. And then he'll stretch a little bit farther. So it'd be 10 meters plus del, essentially the the length of the rope, the length of the spring at any time. So we're looking for del 2, so it's the length of the spring at L2. What's L not? That's the, that's the length of the spring, in this case the rope, at rest, out of the box, which for our purposes is the 10 meters, because that's when it comes tight. So this is... Uh, 10 meters. We're trying to decide whether down here should be positive or negative. If it's positive, if we use the plus 2.7, that means L2 is longer than the rope at rest. If we use the negative 2.4, that means L2 is shorter than the rope at rest, which is the case. Huh? It's longer. It's longer. Got down to the 10 meters, the, there was still essentially slack in the rope. That's when the rope started to, start to tighten up and it stretched a little bit as it brought him to a stop. So we want the positive root here. The plus 2.7 meters. Minus signs are very important in the work energy equation. So, how much force was exerted on that climber? Now we know he's going to fall 10 meters plus another 10 meters and then another 2.7 meters as the rope brings them to a stop. Okay. Yep. That's about that. So, uh, yeah. So you want it to be longer, but why would you subtract? And why would, that would make us smaller to this positive amount of power. No. Remember, it's the del we have here. If this is 2.7, then we know the length of the rope when he finally comes to a stop must be 12.7, which means he's he fell the 10 meters down to here, another 10 meters, 
then another 2.7, so the effective length of the rope from the last protection piece is 2.7 meters. Is Matthew okay with that one? Okay. Bill, okay? Yeah? Mark? Whoever you're texting is okay with it? It's good. Okay with it. What? So he's okay with it. Alright, good. I don't want him to worry. Hey, wait a second. If you're texting him what we're doing, he's not paying tuition. That's theft of services. You watch the videos too, so we don't need to. That's it. Videos come down tonight. People all across the the world are stealing our videos. Your Actually, you you can't get you can't get into our YouTube. I don't think without uh, without logging in. I don't think as a student you've got an iPhone. Did you have to log in as a student to do it? Remember? Yeah, my iTunes. Yeah. Just clicked on the iTunes yeah. link and the iTunes opened. That guy's smarter than we are. He's getting all this for free. But I'm not going to grade his test. What's the force? Uh, negative 13.23 kilonewton. Well, we've got the 2.7 multiplied by the 4.9. Came out to be who? Negative, negative, negative. Ne what's negative mean? It's the uh, direction of which where the force is being. Yeah, it's it, it's a force in opposite of the direction he was moving. He was moving down. The force is going to be opposite to that. And what's that come out to be? Thirteen kilonewtons or one point three kilonewtons? Thirteen kilonewtons. Oops. Thirteen thousand newtons. just about the survivable limit of a human being. Really? Well, less so if he actually did fix the note rope around his neck. That was a dumb thing to do. He should have done it around a harness around his waist. You know, they have, they have rather elaborate web harness things that they wear to spread out that force uh, even more. So, But that's about the limit of what a human being can, can withstand. Uh, at least from the some of the, the mountain climbing uh, data I was able to pull up where I got some of these numbers. All right. Any? Uh, well, what if? What if? Uh, that way, that, well, I'll ask it anyway. What if? What if he fell at only five meters past his? Protection. Would he see more force or less force? Less, less, less. Don't sound very confident. You know. You panic here on the wall, you're going to freeze. And the Colorado Mountain Club has to come get you. Less? Yeah, of course. In fact, it's, uh, it's pretty careless if a climber gets too far beyond their last protection before they put some more protection in. All right, so we're going to develop this, this whole idea then a little bit more. So we'll keep the same numbers. We're just going to look at it all in a slightly different way. We'll keep the same numbers, look at it a slightly different way. Let's see, we've got our work energy equation in general.
for our uh, work on this one, we know that the work term went to zero. For the two points of interest that we were talking about, uh, the delta K went to zero as well. We were only left working with these two terms. Those two terms are very much a function of uh, a function of position. And they each change with each other. As one goes up, the other goes down by the same amount. Because for the problem we were doing, these two terms were both zero, which means if one of those increases, the other's got to decrease and vice versa. And that was a situation of conservation of energy. In fact, at any time in this problem, the total energy was constant where the total energy is the kinetic energy because he, he, he started with no kinetic energy and he finished with none but he certainly had some kinetic energy in between. So those three quantities all added up together are always a constant. And in fact, for this problem, we can calculate what that constant is. And then as any one of them goes down, for instance, his potential, gravitational potential energy drops as soon as the problem starts, he's immediately losing gravitational potential energy. This term starts to go down. What's this term do? Starts to go up because he's picking up speed. What's this term do? Let's say we're only talking about the first 10 meters or so. This one's going down. He's losing 10 meters worth of gravitational potential energy. This one's going up because he's picking up speed. That's what a fall is. What's this one doing? Nothing. The rope is still essentially at rest as he's falling. The rope doesn't come into it until it starts to tighten up down here. So, uh, as he reaches this point, what's UG still doing as he reaches that point? Just, just as he's reaching this point, as he's going past this point here in the middle, where just where the rope starts to go tight, what's happening to these three constants that always add up, sorry, these three terms that always add up to a constant? This one's still dropping because he's still dropping. What's this one doing now just as he gets to this point right here where the rope starts to become tight? That one starts to go up. This one's still dropping because he's still dropping. What's this one start to do? Huh? This one now starts to go down, so it, we can, uh, you can imagine he, his kinetic energy is probably a maximum right here because he'd lost a whole bunch of gravitational potential energy. It had all turned into kinetic energy, but then some of the energy starts to flow into the rope and he starts to slow down there because now finally the rope starting to exert a little bit of force on him. That force grows as the rope stretches more and more and more until the rope stretches a maximum. The force is a maximum. He comes to a stop at the bottom of his fall. And then what? These are still all constant when added together. What's the kinetic energy at the very bottom of the fall? Zero. zero. What's this? Zero. Well, it, we're not sure if it's zero. It depends on where we measured H from, but it's certainly at its minimum. It's not going to get any smaller because that's the bottom of its fall. What's this? 
Minimum, maximum, zero. It's at its maximum. We're at the maximum stretch. Then what happens? He actually bounces. They they take a pretty good bend. You've seen bungee jumpers do that. They jump off the bridge, go down, they hit the bottom, and then they bounce. They take a pretty good bounce back up just in case the front of their pants are still clean. So they go back up for, for more terror and more excitement. Len's, the, Len's taking notes like crazy today. All right, so what I want to do is we're going to look at, uh, at the these two terms together as the potential energy term. Because both of those are potential energy terms. Both of those involve conservative forces. We're going to look at that potential energy term. And it is a function of y, where y is his, his position in the air measured from, from some spot. Uh, and we can arbitrarily pick that like any time we can pick an origin. So we'll say right here is y equals 0. I just arbitrarily chose that. Well, I didn't arbitrarily chose it. I know where the problem's going, and that's a little bit easier place to pick it. But we could pick it anywhere, and the, the results are still going to be the same. All right, so let me clear some board space here. We're going to look at his potential energy terms as a function of y with y equals 0 right here. It involves two terms. In terms of y, with that as y equals 0, what is the potential energy term? What is this potential energy at any height y? What is this term? Well, I'll give you the mg. It's not delta. There's no delta here, so I don't want a delta here. Of what? With respect to Well, remember the deal with the potential energy term? It's, it's in general, it's MGH, where H is measured from where? Wherever. Wherever. Wherever you want to set the origin. And I already did that for you. So this term should be mg y1. and not y1 because we're going to look at him through the entire fall. mg y. Because h, his height at any particular moment, we're now using uh, as, as y. That will be our, our variable of height. If you want to do h as a variable, no sweat. It's just uh, a lot of times we see h as a constant for some reason, I don't know why, just the why we always see is it can be a variable. Uh, wait, what, a, what, a, what about when he passes this point? It's still UG or, or MGY. Still, because his, his Y would just be negative. His potential, gravitational potential energy would be negative because we arbitrarily set a zero point here. What we're most concerned with is the changes and we're still going to get that. All right, let's see. Uh, what's his, his uh, elastic potential energy at any one moment? One half k times del two. Where? Well, no, del two is a single value at this point. 
And I want this as a variable function of height. So we can see how these things all change and, and interchange among each other. Y squared. Would it be one half k y squared? Uh, that would certainly make sense down here, wouldn't it? Because that's that's actually the number we're using. When it gets to the 2.7 meters, that would be the maximum stretch. We'd have the maximum potential energy, so that would be okay. But if we use one half k y, our equation would say he has elastic potential energy up here, which he doesn't. How much? Uh, elastic potential energy does he have in this region? He, he has none. He has no elastic potential energy because remember the rope has not come taut yet. It's still slack. It's just trailing behind him as he falls. The slack is lessening until all the slack is taken up and he starts to stretch the rope after that. But above this, we need that term to always be zero. But I want this as a function of y, so I don't want 1 half k del in here, del squared, because then I'd have two variables. I want one single variable, because then I can graph it. So how could I do, how can I handle this term so that it's a function of y? Below here, that's fine. This is, this is 1 half k y squared would work fine below here. Above that, it wouldn't work. Y minus ten. No, that's not going to quite work either. We, we, we. You're, you're looking unfortunate. Well, not unfortunately. I, I don't blame you one little bit. You're looking for some elegant single solution, and there isn't one. We need a piecewise function. We need this for y greater than or equal to zero. Because the rope doesn't even come into it yet. And then below that, we need, well, the mgy still applies. He's still falling. Um, he's just gone below our, our arbitrarily chosen reference point. Then we add on the 1 half k y squared there for y less than or equal to zero. Does that make sense? Is that what the deal is? Between one and y equals zero, only mgy is coming into play. The only thing that's going on there is he's losing gravitational potential energy. They both can't be. Yeah, zero. Sure they can. Well, then which one do you use? This just this just says they have to it ha they, these two functions have to be continuous. If they're zero, it's zero. Yeah, at y equals zero, they're both zero, and the functions match. What we don't want is whatever this function looks like to take a huge jump at y equals zero because that's not going to make any sense. All of a sudden, a whole bunch of energy came from somewhere instantaneously, or a whole bunch disappeared. So the fact they're both equal to zero just means the functions are continuous. The slopes might not be, but the functions are continuous, right? <coughs> and, uh, um, everybody's familiar with that term from pre-calculus or something? <coughs> continuous functions? Never heard of it. All right, so, never heard of it. So we can plot as a function of height, above our arbitrarily chosen y equals zero, <coughs> we can plot his potential energy. At y equals, let's see, what's the biggest point? <coughs> At 20 meters, 
How much energy does he have? Not including what power bars he just ate and how much Gatorade he drank. That's what I'm talking about here. How much gravitational potential plus elastic potential energy does he have yeah. at the 20 meters? At the 20 meter height. It's MGY, where Y is 20 meters. Figure it out. 15,696. How much? 15,696. Just going to buy that? Sounds pretty fair. 15.7 uh, kilojoules. So right here, what'd you say? Fifteen point seven kilojoules, right? Yeah. Kilojoules? Because yeah. you said fifteen thousand seven hundred joules. Yep. Uh, this graph is for the potential energy for gravity and for elastic. Right? Yeah, we're we're graphing this function. So is it going to be a constant? Boy, that's a very good question. Isn't it just going to be a constant? Didn't I say energy was conserved? Is it going to be a constant? What did I say was going to be conserved? Because there's no outside work being done. The W term is zero. I said that's a situation of conservation of energy. Energy would be conserved. Energy would be a constant. So isn't this just a constant then? No, it's not. Why not? Yeah, what did I say was constant? I didn't say this was constant. I said this plus kinetic energy was constant. These two are going to change together. That they're not only they individually change, but their total is going to change. Because some of that is going to kinetic energy as he speeds up. And then it's going to come back from the kinetic energy back into these two terms as he slows down and comes to a stop finally. And then there is no kinetic energy. It's all come back into here. And then he's going to take his bounce. And he's going to bounce there forever because nobody can get to him. So we're going to start here. This is indeed the constant total energy level. We'll never go above that for our total energy because we don't have anywhere for our energy to come to, come into the problem. As he falls, as Y decreases, as he falls towards this arbitrarily chosen origin, what happens to our energy curve, our potential energy curve? What happens to what we're trying to graph here? What happens to this? Decreases. He's fallen. What's the curve look like? So I can sketch it in. Let's see. Uh, for this part here, I need to graph that. Because that's that part there. That's the y greater than zero part. What's that equation look like? That's a straight line. M's a constant, G's a constant. This is mx plus b. What's b? The intercept. There isn't one. At y equals zero, this term becomes zero. So we know it's a straight line from here to here. Isn't it? Straight line. Uh, ooh, positive slope or negative slope? 
positive. M is positive, G is positive, it's a positive slope. Only we're not going out that way, we're coming back, but that's still a positive slope. So there's his potential energy curve for the trip down to y equals zero, just our arbitrarily, arbitrarily chosen y equals zero point. If we picked it some other point, that's just going to shift this line somewhere else, but the curve shape isn't going to change at all. Comfortable with that? It's got positive slope, mg, see that's a positive slope, even though what we're really doing is coming this way down the graph because he's falling. Then what does the graph do? Well, now we, he falls past our origin spot, continues down into the negative y region, which is this equation. So, you need to see what that equation says. And since we're out of time, and you need something to do for the weekend, otherwise you're going to end up in jail somehow, Yeah, I'm looking at you, Patrick. So, speeding or something, most likely. I saw you with that thing out there. God dang. Joey, you saw that? I ducked into my office. Joey didn't have anywhere to go. He was exposed there. It was terrible. Your job is to finish the curve. You know he's going to go a little bit farther. He's going to go to some maximum position and then he's going to bounce from there. So he's going to go a little bit farther. In fact, we already know how much farther. What was it? 2.7 meters. We know he's going to go another 2.7 meters. You find out what that curve does in between for Monday. What? Maybe. Maybe I was joking. I never try to mislead students. Isn't that right, Alan? That's right. Okay. Let me turn off the tape and then I'll... <laughs>